Just a reminder that the Missing Witches podcast is entirely listener-funded. If you love the project and want to support us and join in on conversations like this one live, find us on Patreon at patreon.com slash missingwitches. You aren't being a proper woman, therefore you must be a witch. You must be a witch. Happy Juneteenth, everybody! Welcome to our Juneteenth celebration of liberation and what possible better guest could we have celebrating Juneteenth with us today than the author of the new book, Hoodoo for Everyone. And I want to read the subtitle too, because it's part of the reason we're here. Modern approaches to magic, conjure, root work, and liberation. And that last word is what we really want to focus on today. I will read you something very quickly and then I'm going to hand you the microphone. Um, Our guest last year for Juneteenth was Lakeisha Harris, who is the co-founder of Black Witch University. And she recently posted, I'm so disgusted at the colonization of Juneteenth. This is the reason for the season. We never wanted plates and napkins and ice cream. We want justice. We want to thrive. Not a damn CNN music special where you pay the Black elite to hold space and sing, change is going to come. Sam Cooke is tired, she wrote. The river is tired. I'm tired. And so again, we'll talk about all that, but the word liberation was so important to you and your work that you put it in the title of your book. And that's how we want to how we want to celebrate Juneteenth. We run the risk of like what we see happening with pride, pink washing, where the justice aspect, the liberation aspect is completely lost under late stage capitalism. (laughs) And, And we're trying to avoid that today by once again, focusing on the real message of Juneteenth, which is Black liberation in America. So I'm going to pass you the mic, Sherry Schoen. I know you have a lot to say on this. And thank you again so much for celebrating with us today. Absolutely. I am so excited to celebrate this with you and also everyone that will be listening, um, as well as those that are in the coven that are on the call with us today. It is an honor to be able to speak about Black liberation and Juneteenth and giving honor to the ancestors and those that are still here working and doing the cause because they're not gone it isn't like something that it was like oh you know that was something we talked about back in the 60s it's over now no it's not no it's not if you go to a mall if you go rent a car if you um if you are buying a house if you are changing your hair if you are walking across a stand to go get your diploma you will notice that black liberation isn't here yet you know, and it's just, and it, it's, I'm excited that it falls on the same month as Pride because there are so many similarities with how the colonization and capitalization is trying to take root. And we, as a witch community, we as a coven, it is our job to me to provide that deliverance and knowledge and education so that. Our rituals, our spells during this month are about the liberation and not about, oh, we get to wear something cute. Like I have a very cute little shirt on today, just as cute, just as cute, but (laughs) it's flaming lip pride. Yes, love it. However, (laughs) when I go spend my dollars at a store, that's how I say where my pride is. When I buy Black products, when I support Black witches, when I support Black communities, that's my way to celebrate liberation and celebrate Juneteenth. All of those things make up more than what, you know, what she mentioned, an ice cream. Okay, y'all, the ice cream, the plates, the, all of that. When did that come? Anyway. So yeah, so we have a lot to talk about. <laughs> yeah, and it's I an mean, honor. you know, it's it's scary that um, something can be co-opted so easily, um, mm-hmm. and to, to turn a profit. 
anything it's terrifying it, it's very terrifying because even when it comes to women's bodies um years ago there was the silhouette dress make your body into a silhouette so that you look smaller because that's what we need and that dress sold out Right, because our bodies are meant to be small at the waist and larger at the hips than the breasts. And everyone said, Yeah, that's what I want to wear. I was tempted to go buy it. And then I said, Wait a minute, is that my body or somebody else's? Because my body in the dress doesn't fit like that. I got lumps and curves and thin areas. <laughs> Where's my silhouette dress? <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah, I, I joked with a friend of mine once that, you know, the body types are like pear, apple, banana. And I said, my body type is a bag of grapes. <laughs> mine too. And where's that? Where's that silhouette? And why are they naming our body shapes after food? For, con for because it's for consumption, right? Now that you mention it. We are for consumption, right? We are a fruit bearing, seed holding provider. That's all we are. We're a shell. We're a shell to propagate and to bring forth more fruit. Really? I don't have a mind. Where's my mind shape? Isn't it funny how I, don't I have a walnut shape? How, right. how like all forms of liberation are truly connected? They're all they're all connected. When um, so I'm gonna. Ooh, whew. So when I start talking to you about Opal and I talk to you about um, where Juneteenth originated, we're going to talk about when one of us is hurting, all of us is hurting. So whew, we're ready. We're ready. <laughs> I feel like you were born ready. <laughs> <I'm> just... <laughs> because when you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. <laughs> don't you kind of feel that for our ancestors? We were, I was on a, um, I do a lot of Marco Polo, which is one way communication recorded that someone else can then reply back their one recorded communication too. Um, because I tend to have an issue when I'm trying to do two way conversations where I have to tell myself, wait, listen, think and listen to what the person is saying. <laughs> Don't immediately start thinking, oh no, I know what I'm gonna say after that. So. Marco Polo is perfect for me because I can get through. But anyway, and one of our groups, it's a group of us that are coming from different points of view. We are, one of us is adopted. One of us is a sister. One of us is a faux sister or a, an adoptive sister that we have. And then there's me and we all talk about religion and faith and manifestation and Abraham Hicks and every, I mean, just everything in between. And one topic that we had this time around was around how our faith was shaped from trauma and abuse and how that's one thing that connects so many of us. And isn't that a legacy that we want to stop as women? But instead, and many times you hear the story of I was born out of an abusive relationship and therefore I chose an abusive, abusive relationship and therefore my child is probably going. Anyway, so I think that because unfortunately that's what binds us together, that's also a good place for us to start is ending the self-hatred, ending the self-talk, ending the ways that we treat each other and ending the ways that we speak to each other as women when we call each other out of our names whether it's a karen or a blah or a blah or a blah that is abuse to each other as women and as women as our liberating factor if we don't live get it together no one else is going to appreciate us Okay, so liberation there. All right, where else do we want to go? Let's let's go back to uh, the the reason for the season. Let's go back. Yeah. <clears throat> what is your perspective on the history of Juneteenth? So the history of Juneteenth to me. So I wasn't taught Juneteenth as a history lesson. Um, I was taught from a very white nationalistic citizenship as being true watermelon eating on the July the fourth 
celebrating that if you did anything other than that, you weren't really an American. That was put into my head. You attend the parade, you wear the flag, which actually is against the law. Anyway, you wear the flag, you hang the flag proudly, um, you have barbecue, there is none of this. Well, I'm a vegan. I, no, no, that's not American either. Um, but once I grew up, <laughs> once I grew up spiritually, I sought out more information about what my soul needed to be fed because I had almost a soul, um, a soul drought that I was feeling where something was telling me, you're not being quenched yet. You're seeking, you're reading tarot, but you're not being quenched. You're playing around with runes, but you're not being quenched. You're reciting the chants of another culture, but you're not being quenched. And when I sought that out, I said, well, I got to go back and learn my own history of roots. And that brought me to Juneteenth. Um, I would go to the Juneteenth celebration. I was originally born and raised in Colorado. And in Colorado, there's a thing called a Juneteenth celebration, and it is the same weekend as Pride celebration. So Juneteenth, you have a festival of a lot of darker bodies and everyone displaying their artwork and everybody celebrating soul food and everything else. And it's almost like you have a, two different mindsets and even dress codes, right? So when I'm at the Juneteenth, I have on maybe some cut off shorts and a nice linen shirt and I have my dreads loud and proud and that kind of thing. And then when I would hop into my car and head over to Pride, Les would come off, I would take off Les more and more and I would be in the rainbow, right? Um, but when I see Juneteenth, I saw more of my people and celebrating music, dancing, food. And then I would go see the other people at Pride through music, dancing, and food. But it was with Juneteenth that I saw the deeper soul work because I got to see artwork and I got to see practitioners and I got to see musicians that looked and sounded and felt like me. And that's how I started to experience Juneteenth. And I didn't really think about the parts of it that meant that would really feed my soul until I started getting back into the church culture. And in the church culture, because even in my book, I talk about this constant struggle with me and church and religion and spirituality and still being liberated. Because to me, the very nature of the church, even the black church is to hold me down and to push me into somebody else's box and to conform me into their thoughts and words. Don't have a thought of a woman or a leader if you are in the black church. Um, your job is to be a church mother. Your job is to serve. Your job is to be an usher. Your job is to be married in a church, to have more children in the church so that you can propagate more of the church foundation. That's what your job is. Um, but when I grew up in the Church of God in Christ, the one thing that I loved was testimony service because that was the one time that I actually felt spirit, that I felt a spiritual feeding that nothing else can fill. And it wasn't until later that I learned I didn't have to be in a church to have that happen. But when I was growing up, that's where I did. And so the spirit would get loose and people would speak in tongues and people, people would run up and down the aisles. And I always wanted to be a runner because I felt like they had the most freedom. They would, they, the music would start and we'd all be clapping and having a good time. And then all of a sudden, brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so, something would just go, oh, dun, 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 and they would run up and down the field. And I was like, I'm not saved enough. I'm not holy enough. I'm because <laughs> all I do is cry. What kind of weak? <laughs> what kind of weak person am I? Um, yeah, and all I was was a crier. But then it wasn't. I noticed later on that as my spirit of discernment started, and I could actually start reading more, 
of what was really truly going on as far as spiritual things that are going around and energies that were going around while everybody was running and floating and doing things and speaking in tongues, I could actually see the spirits that were going through those pews. Then I said, oh, this is something more than a symptom. You know, running was a symptom. Crying was a symptom. Hollering out loud is a symptom. And it's a symptom that you're being touched by something bigger than you. Um, when you're liberated, you can't stop that voice. When I'm truly liberated, and in this time of Juneteenth, when our voices are no longer silenced, then to me, Juneteenth will absolutely be a reality. We'll be liberated. Yes, because we, right. we're, we're still working out that emancipa emancipation proclamation. I mean, I don't think there's anyone that would say that we've we've lived up to the to the promise of the emancipation proclamation right well if if you are in some schools now yes they are teaching we are liberated um the the slaves were actually products of a agreement they were resources the same way our cattle and the same way horses and the same way it was sugar and the same way as wheat and corn, we were products. We weren't human, we were products. And we were part of that. And we entered into a trade agreement with our enslavers and they were actually our employers, not our enslavers. So this is the stuff that's being taught in schools now is that it wasn't, it wasn't anything to really worry about. It was just part of being part of a capitalist society. I mean, I, I didn't mean to get into this, um, but I mean, we're here. This notion of it being like illegal to teach critical race theory in schools. Yes. And obviously this yes. goes hand in hand with the don't say gay. Uh, yes. all, yes. all liberation is, is connected. Coincidence that we're all in the same month. It is not. I mean, it, it it boggles the mind this I mean obviously there are you know uh, prejudiced people out there who who don't want to believe that people who are different than they are are people there are people out there who believe that but for that to come into our schools I mean what is school even for then <laughs> like, what is school for and school right now because even when you want to say your truth and learn history there's no history. They, they are limiting the what can be taught and finding those teachers that are bold enough to say, it is my job to educate. That's why I became a teacher. And they're being told, no, you can only educate on what our ideals are in this local area. Anything else outside of that, they are to learn by their parents who maybe are non-existent or not as educated as the person that actually took years and years of study to become an actual teacher. And they're leaving that up to them because of the fear of, oh, we could be sued, we could be protested against. And really that's back to capitalism too. We're worried that our funding will go away. Mm. We don't wanna to truly speak the truth because our funding will go away. Right. It is all about funding. And the minute they stopped preaching critical race theory, that's because they wanted to start privatizing schools where their money could stop going to public schools where they have to dare to teach the children of immigrants, which we all are, but I won't even go there. But <laughs> they wanted to start moving everyone's funds to private schools where they could teach them their way and they would not have to mix with all of these others that they're afraid of. And we are all, I mean, by virtue of you listeners listening to this podcast, I don't know if you call yourself a witch or not, but we are most of us here othered in some way or another. And it's like uh, Faith Ringwald said, I, I went to school and got my education and then I went out and got my real education. She had learned, you know, like you said about your own life, she had learned nothing about um, African history of any kind other than 
you know, this, like, the lie of emancipation, really, you know. You just have the lie of the emancipation. You, you know, you, you look at the emancipation, and the emancipation um, was signed back in 1963. It was signed by Lincoln back in 1963, and Lincoln actually 18. Um, signed it at 1863, sorry. <laughs> you know what, it does, yeah. Um, but you're exactly right. He he actually signed it September 22nd, 1862. He issued the preliminary, and then it was declared January 1st, 1863. That basically says all enslaved people in the state currently engaged in rebellion against the Union shall be then, thenceforth, and forever free. Okay all enslaved people. So that included, but it wasn't recognized, that also included First Nations. That included our Latin brothers and sisters that were working in the fields just as hard as we were. Okay, let's step it back, step back, because I know I might already feel the eyes rolling. Why you gotta bring, I'm gonna bring up everybody. Because when one of us is hurting, all of us is hurting. So emancipation for first nation didn't happen for several years after that right but anyway that was when it was signed was in 1863 the celebration of juneteenth was taking us back to it took two years before everyone in the united states knew that juneteenth that actually the emancipation proclamation was in effect and that didn't happen until 1865, on June 19, 1865. And that is when the final enslaved Africans in Galveston, Texas, were informed they were free. And that is why we celebrate it on June 19. Um, however, is that truly when we were all free? No. Right. It's, it's it's almost like you're working at your job and someone comes in and they say, oh, by the way, um, you don't work here anymore. Does your work end? Do your bills end? Does your family get fed? How how does any of that still happen? Um, all of that was still happening June 20th, 1865, right? We still had that. And they and it was like, oh, we can now celebrate. They're free. They're free. We had no land, we had no jobs at that point, we had no ways of making income at that point. There were still a lot of things to figure out. And for those people that kind of say, yeah, but you could just go back and what the mini enslaved did is they just went back to their plantation and said, okay, can you actually hire me now? Because I don't have any other skills. Or they would try to go into the industrial area and do what? They, were they taught reading? Were they, was anyone educated? No, no. So freedom really truly wasn't happening until then. Um, all right, so now let's talk about Juneteenth and it becoming a federal holiday. Should we go there? Okay. Let's go. So Biden signed that it was a federal holiday last year, right? And see, my whole pod popped out because something doesn't want me to say the truth. But anyway, I'm gonna keep going. <laughs> I'm gonna find my little ear pod. <laughs> Ooh, see, that's what happens when we all get together. And it goes stuff. flying. And the things start popping out, and they're like, no, no, say that. You're gonna upset somebody, but that's okay. Because if you're listening, you're probably not upset. You probably want to hear from us. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I believe that. He did that as a way to try to appease and calm those of us that were uprising against critical race theory. So it was a PR statement. And I believe that with all my heart. Um, why do I believe that? Because in the Obama administration, Juneteenth was not made a federal holiday. Politics aside, when that happened, no. When um, we had Kennedy, Juneteenth wasn't celebrated. When we had Bush, when Reagan, no, no, Clinton, no. So um, I'm happy that it is a federal holiday. Um, it isn't sour grapes for me, but 
when you want to celebrate liberation, what about buying back guns? What about not taking away black bodies or protection of black women and their rights to have abortions? What about free birth control? What about stopping policing of blacks and brown bodies and the imprisonment of our whole societies as a people and killing those that are lucky enough to make the journey from arrest or jail? That to me would be more of a statement. <laughs> right. I um, mean, yeah. that's, that's just a federal holiday. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I love a stat holiday as much as the, the next person, but I would rather see prisons for profit made illegal like you say i I would rather see the 13th amendment that basically makes slavery you know legal if you've been arrested and as we know you know black and brown bodies get arrested at a much higher statistical rate all of these things that would have been real something real that would have been great if we could have done that however with i believe a biden harris administration they're pretty conservative. And so they want black and bodies, brown bodies fed to stay in the prisons. That's a great profit for them. It looks great to the voters and it keeps those others away too. Because when you're walking in a neighborhood like mine, because I live in a very rural suburban neighborhood and you see a black body walk by, and I know this because it happens, not because of critical race theory, because in my body it happens every day. And my reality is my fact. When I go past my neighbor's house and I have a neighbor that gets out and makes it a point to ask, where do I live? That to me speaks to their privileged sense of you don't belong here, you are other. There's no other reason for them to ask that. And even if you as someone of a different color gets asked that same question, ask yourself, okay, why are they asking? Are they asking out of true neighborly love? No, they are saying you don't belong. And they are probably saying you don't belong because of your outward appearance. And if they're saying if you don't belong because of your outward appearance, start to look at what you have that they don't, and then you'll find your other. Yes. I mean, you are a a Black lesbian, you tick a a bunch of those overlapping other boxes, and yet you refuse to put that onto other people. I mean, the perfect example, your book is called Hoodoo for Everyone. (laughs) And I know last time you and I spoke when we were talking about uh, the Hoodoo Guide to the Bible, which again, listeners get both of these books uh, and go back. We'll put that episode in the show notes for this because honestly, Sherry helped me to reclaim my ancestral connection to the Bible, which I had for many years, very harshly rejected, very, very harshly. So we will, we will put that in the show notes so that you can go back and listen to that if you haven't already. But it, it, maybe it's a little controversial for you to say that hoodoo is for everyone. Absolutely. It, it's very controversial because I have been shunned by hoodoo practitioners that say you're not really, hoodoo should be a closed practice and it should only be taught black on black. And here's my question to that. How black is black? In American history, if you had one drop of black blood, you were denied the right to vote. You were automatically assumed to be enslaved and anyone could come and take you at any minute and the children and property and everything else that you held dear. So if that is the case and you have one drop of American black, African black, Latin black blood in your body, then you should be black enough to get hoodoo lessons. But to many other hoodoo practitioners, no, I want you to prove to me that you're black before I teach you. Um, What if I have a condition where I am lighter than most and I can't take pigment? Am I now not black? Because you don't see me outwardly as black. Is it in how I speak? Is it where I grew up? Is it my parents? What if I was adopted? What if I'm fostered? All of these questions make me say, you know what? If you and your heart feel that you can respect the African-American experience, you can respect 
the journey and the trauma and the tragedies that we go through. And you can respectfully, without appropriating hoodoo for your own causes, then yes, feel free. Practice hoodoo. And, and that's what I the book is about. Yeah. Yes. I how to, how do to do that. Yeah. And how to do that. It's a lot of my personal stories of how I got to where I am. But hopefully in those stories, they see that shared connection. I bring up shared ancestors that I have asked in my own history, can you please help this person reading this book to help them with their hoodoo journey, regardless of where they are in their walk in life? That's gender, that's sexual identity, that's associate, that's whatever that is. I, and I found those shared ancestors and those stories are the stories that are in the book. There's the story of the blue lady. There's the story of tall man. There's the story of my dad. There's the story of Michael. There's so many stories that help that person reading the book hopefully see where they fit in their place in their hoodoo walk. Yeah, and and yeah. It's, certainly you 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 talk about it in the book um, about this notion of who is allowed and and who isn't allowed. But I will say for those listeners who um, are are whitey white white, not a single drop to be found in their whole Germanic lineage you can still get something out of this book. If you, if you feel uncomfortable with the notion of practicing something that belongs to African-American people, that's okay. Uh, I always say that I, I like to learn about trad traditional African religion, not so I can practice it, but so that we can undo the lie that we have been told about, you know, this wisdom not existing. Certainly, even if you are Whitey McWhiterton and you're sitting there thinking, there's no way that I'm going to go out and start practicing hoodoo, I, they're going to protest. And that's fine if you feel that way, if you want to feel very sensitive about it. But I'm here to tell you that this, this book is for everyone, whether you want to practice or not, this book is for you. You brought up Michael. Do you want to Tell oh, a little bit of this story, because this so, is... So, shared ancestor Michael, um, he was someone that I was close to when I was dating. I dated his father. Um, he was a beautiful gay youth. Beautiful. And it was back in that time where I had in my head and heart that it was my job to judge and judge harshly. And... He came to me in love and truth and said, I'm gay and my parents don't understand me. What should I do? And we shared tea and the story is more in the book, but it's about my experiences and my approach and really my plea to ask for his forgiveness. I give a way that you can honor Michael in ritual. Um, I talk about where his journey ended. And I talk about how you can use his journey in your own practice if you have a need to get forgiveness or protection from him or guidance from him. He's a beautiful shared ancestor, um, especially if you're doing some work with someone who is wanting to identify their real reality and wanted to speak their real truth and unfortunately is not heard or listened to. Um, yeah, and now he's one of my ancestors that I can talk to when I'm not really sure the right things to say, and he will give me that knowledge and guidance because he was a young soul, but he was very knowledgeable. Yeah, and this, uh, you propose, is a version of emancipation. Self-love is a version of emancipation. The love of your community is a version of emancipation. We are emancipating ourselves from A, being othered, and B, from harming ourselves because we've been told or we have thought or... Yeah, that, those words, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a story that when you're trying to teach children the power and the harm of words, you start with a tube of toothpaste and you give every child of two little tube travel, travel size of toothpaste and you give them a little piece of paper and you say, okay, in 30 seconds, I want you to squeeze out all of the toothpaste 
and they start to do it. And then after they're done and everybody's so excited, look how much I pulled and it's all on a big pile. It's so cool. And then you give them a plastic knife. You say, okay, now you have two minutes to push it all back. Those are words. Those are words. Those are words that will never go back into that toothpaste. And I think that the words that we share for each other, again, it's back to that when that voice is not monitored, when that voice no longer is harming, when that voice is no longer afraid to speak out, then we're truly free. And that's for everybody. That's for everybody. Yeah. Can you tell us the story of the pink ladies? Oh, the pink ladies. So the <laughs> pink ladies is the story of a quilt that's in my family. When I wrote book one, I did not have possession of the quilt. I thought it was lost forever. And we moved, me and my family, my dad, who's also a shared ancestor in the book, my imperfect dad, my hero. Um, but my um, the pink ladies is a quilt that my grandmother made, my great, great grandmother made that she would lay on top of me whenever I would start to have visions and I couldn't go to sleep. So I was terrified. Um, I would see death. I would see murder. I would see rapes. I would see everything, trauma and tragedy. Um, we would go into a concert hall and I would sit in a chair that someone unfortunately did something bad and I sat on it and I would see them and I would see what they did. Um, I would go on a bus and same thing. And so when I got at home and laid my head on the pillow, this would not leave. And my great grandma, who always was around me, would lay the pink lady's quilt on me. And the pink lady's quilt was a woman who was faced one way, you never got to see her face. It was a very popular pattern of quilt making back in the day, but it was white, pink, white, pink, white, pink of the same lady in a dress with a beautiful skirt and a bonnet where her face was shielded and she was always looking one direction, not at you. And when I was underneath the pink lady's quilt, all of it went away. I could concentrate, I could get sleep, I could get comfort and joy. So book two starts and I'm writing and I'm telling all of my ancestors and guys what book two is going to be about because I just got it like that. And my ancestors said, nope. My dad said, nope, you're not going to talk about heroes and heroines because that was what book two was supposed to be about. You're going to talk about your stories and why we have to start including everyone in our walks. We have to stop separating each other as spiritual practitioners, as healers, as lovers of this wisdom and this education, who are we to say that we have the monopoly on any kind of knowledge? Any kind, because it's shared. From the minute they put ochre on the cave walls, it was shared. It was meant to be viewed and seen, and not viewed and seen in a way that I as Sherry, I as that hoodoo lady, you as Amy could say, you know what? I actually don't want you to read that. <laughs> actually, don't. No. You can go into the, I don't want you to read it. But really to say that if spirit guides them to find through their own walk, the cave where your initials and symbols are, and they respect it and are not there to wipe the symbols off or to take the symbols for their own and say, look what I made, because that's a lie then who are we to come behind them and say, you're actually not worthy? I'm not that big yet. I will never be that. Never. I'm not that big to tell anybody that they're not worthy. No. Nor should we ever be. Right? And I know that even in my, in my book, I try to be very honest about my own fragility, my own inner turmoil, my own mistakes because all of us make it. And I hate it when people write a book and they make it seem like, and look at everything that I do with love and light and it's beautiful crystals. <laughs> no, it's, <laughs> we've all gone through something that helps us need deliverance from something. And not even of a place of victim, but a place of, I had no, right? I had no electricity, but I still needed to cook. That's deliverance. 
I needed to have my rent paid. And I know right now in my account, there's negative two, right? Those are deliverance requests that everyone goes through. I'm at the hospital and my partner, my brother, my sister, my aunt, my uncle, my grandpa, my grandma, someone, my friend, my dear friend is there and there's nothing I can do about it. But ask for some kind of deliverance on their behalf. These are the kind of stories that you use hoodoo for. It isn't for, I wish I knew what hair to wear today. <laughs> that is not what it's for. <laughs> hoodoo has come from a place of enslavement for deliverance. So if you're in a placement of enslavement, whatever that enslavement is, then hoodoo's for you. Whatever that enslavement is. Whatever that enslavement is. I... I um, posted something yesterday about how I've started to use elixirs and juices and teas as offering for those ancestors that had an issue with alcohol, or even for those of us that are walking a sober journey. Um, we don't have to use alcohol because maybe that's one of our enslavers. Mm. So why as a practitioner would I say, well, I don't know. You just got to put down some whiskey because that's what they like. No, you don't. You don't. Not if it's one of your enslavers. Let that enslaver go. Tell them go. Yes. And that uh, it, what's so wonderful about your, well, one of the many, 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 many things that's wonderful about your approach is that you you do. You're very much like tailor it to your situation. Tailor it to your environment. Tailor it to your emotion. Tailor it to your circumstance. What you have in the cupboard. What you have in the cupboard, if, if I have in my ritual that I would like you to use chamomile tea and you don't even like tea, great. What do you have? <laughs> do you have some grass? Do you have access to some mint? Do you have something that smells good in your house that you like that calms you down? Okay, chamomile is used to calm situations. What else do you have in your house that calms situations? What if it's a teddy bear? Why can't you use that teddy bear? Guess what? You can. <laughs> you yeah. can. And if, if you're diabetic and something wants a lot of sugar, oh. like the, the, n- none of your ancestors want you to harm yourself. We can say that. None of your ancestors want you to harm yourself. And if your ancestor is telling you to harm yourself, then that's the ancestor not to listen to. We have our own spirit of discernment for a reason. For a reason. Spirit of discernment. <laughs> I love that. I'm you writing it down. <laughs> Discernment. That is a word that we don't use enough. We don't. We don't. We do not use it enough. And I remember in my journey, we were taught spirit of discernment, which is insight or judgment. Keeping keen insight and good judgment. So when um, I was in my walk as a church person and I would have a situation where my spirit told me to say something to someone else I also got a spirit of discernment with that too and if I heard so-and-so sister so-and-so is walking this journey of candy addiction um, I want you to walk up to her as a young child to this grown-ass adult and say that she's going to be healed of this candy addiction. Okay. But I also had a spirit of discernment that let me know who to talk to and tell the candy addiction and who not to. And there are some times in life when you get that, you'll be on a bus somewhere and you will be perfectly free to have a talk with someone. And if they ask you what you do and what you heard for them, you may share that. But then there are others who maybe don't have a spirit of discernment where they don't even know who you are and they walk up to you and they say, oh, spirit told me to tell you that you're having an affair and I need to tell you to heal. Could you please? Just, just because it's right doesn't mean it needs to be right now. It doesn't need to be right now. And that's what we're supposed to get that message, they'll get it. They'll get it. And it doesn't have to be by you. They'll get it. It's just that. Oh, what a relief. Right. Am I supposed to talk to them right now? Or are you going to let them know and you're just letting me know so that I know? Oh, okay. You're just letting me know. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for that message. 
And then when you see them, you say, oh, I really hope that they get through their deliverance that they need. And that's what they need is you saying to yourself as part of your prayer, as part of your ritual, I hope they get the deliverance they need. Because as a lover of self and a lover of self-love, I want them to have the self-love that they need so that they can love themselves to get themselves into a situation that they don't need deliverance. And that's what I'm asking for them. I'm asking that they get deliverance with for whatever they need. I want to uh, read something from the story of the pink ladies. If you don't mind. Um, for those of you at home following along, this is on page 149 of Hoodoo for Everyone, Modern Approaches to Magic, Conjure, Root Work, and Liberation. <laughs> um, she, she being your grandmother, yes. she would take the, very important, grandmother would take the pink lady's quilt out of the trunk and put it on me. Then she would whisper a, a Bible verse in my ear, rub sweet blessed oil on my forehead and put me back to sleep. I would dream wonderfully after that. This, my friend, is hoodoo. The oils, the Bible verse, and the blessed quilt. Hoodoo uses all these elements and more, but, and here we're leading to my question, but you wrote, to get good at it, you must start with Bible knowledge. Why must we start with Bible knowledge? Start with Bible knowledge because as enslaved persons, that was the first book we were allowed to be part of. We were told that we were slaves because of stories in the Bible book. We were told that we were to remain slaves because of the Bible. We were told that our faith was to a God that we knew nothing about because in our indigenous industry and in our indigenous religion traditions, we were taught by a monolithic God and we were also taught by polytheism. But we still didn't have this version of this Jesus in many of those places, unless you're, unless you're, um, unless your area, your, um, your area was colonized, you didn't know anything about a, a, a white God or a, a a Jesus like that. You have several gods or goddesses, or you had one god that maybe was an animal, or that maybe was another spirit that had nothing to do with what we talked about in the Bible. But because all of our rig religious traditions could be transferred to this new god, because that's what we were forced to use, we started to use the Bible as a way to show how to get out of those situations and read through the lines. So we would have someone who was a black preacher on the slave sites that would say, this is what you need to do. And then you would have another person who would take that same oral knowledge and say, actually, this is how I'm going to turn this around. And this is how you're going to get your freedom. Totally different totally different. And that's how I practice Bible knowledge is I want to learn. Um, there's a, there's a, there's a um, verse that I say over and over and over and over in the book from second Timothy. Um, and that is second Timothy two fifteen. study to show thyself approved one that doesn't need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So when you are learning about yourself, your whole self, and you are not afraid to question your God, your goddesses, your Arishas, your healers, your practitioners, the hoodoo lady, missing witches, if you're not afraid to question, then you also are free. Because the spirit that I know of, the deity that I know of, does not feel bothered by your questions you are here to question study to show yourself approved a work person that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth it's back to that discernment to have discernment you have to know the bible stories and judge for yourself what is true and what is a lie yes i want to repeat if you're not afraid to question 
then you are free. Speaking Mm. of our Emancipation Proclamation, and we can write Mm -hmm. Emancipation Proclamations for ourselves, maybe. Um, And I love that idea. Writing your own emancipation, what makes you free? You know, Um, going back to Juneteenth, Opal Lee started the Juneteenth being an actual holiday from her home in Fort Worth, Texas, 40 years ago. Her whole journey was to make, as a Texan educator, she was a teacher of history, AIDS outreach, um, business, Good Samaritan. Um, She served on the Grandmother's Club, the Humanitarian Club. She's an active member of the church. She's in her 90s. She still walks for Juneteenth to be a national holiday. And she wasn't celebrated until last year. But she coined the phrase, none of us are free until all of us are free. And she meant that for everyone, not just Blacks. Yeah. None of us are free until all of us are free. Let's say it one more time. None of us are free until all of us are free. And I'm going to ask our listeners to ask yourselves this question that Sherry just posed. What makes you free? What makes you free? I I don't have an answer for you. (laughs) I I just want us all to ask ourselves this. Custom... And I think that's another thing that I talk about in the book or try to portray in the book is even your hoodoo journey will be custom to you. It won't be my journey. My journey was my, and that's why I, I, I read in some reviews that some people were pretty not pretty upset that my, my book had two chapters of nothing but my personal story. And that's because as part of the personal stories, I want you to weave in okay, this is her story about the pink lady. What do I have that's a pink lady? And keep that knowledge for yourself because all of us have a similar type of story where we've been embarrassed, ashamed, hurt, angered, happy, joyful, and turn that around and make your own journey of this is my journey and my book of shadows to hoodoo, even if I don't practice. What is my lineage? What is my history? What is my knowledge of Bible? If it's nothing, why is it nothing? And do I want to start actually doing some bibliomancy on the Bible and just kind of go, I'm going to read through as a, as doing bibliomancy, I'm going to pick up a book. Um, There's a thing on TikTok now where everybody's like, pick up a book and turn to page page 30 and whatever. No, I'm not going to say that. But as a person that does bibliomancy, which is just basically divination through some type of written text. I want you to pick up the Bible, flip, 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 flip. And then when you're told to stop, then look at that chapter and verse and see how that applies in your life and in your deliverance request. And if it doesn't make sense to you, what you found as a verse or chapter, then this is where your study begins. This is where your second Timothy 2.15 picks in. Why is it not making sense? And it requires you to do the research. And the reason I want you to get in the practice of research, research, research is because as a hoodoo practitioner, it's an oral history, but it teaches you to do your own history, do your own research so that you aren't fooled by someone else that comes into your house or comes into your healing practice or comes into your hoodoo work and tries to tell you that you don't have the right to speak your truth. We often uh, we often sign our emails, you and I, Sherry, with uh, to each other. Well, not to maybe to everyone, <laughs> to each other, with uh, Jeremiah twenty nine eleven. There's mm-hmm. there's a lot of stuff that in the Bible that has been used to hurt us, but there is a lot of stuff in there that we can use. Jeremiah 29, 11, a know that I have plans for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. And I love to use that and, and say it to my friends, you know, Jeremiah 29, 11, like I have plans to prosper you. Prosper, because the... the- And that's another thing that I think that the Bible did very well is it incites some kind of trigger. (laughs) 
those words are, it's a sacred text because for many of us, when we trigger, it's a call to action, whatever that action is, right? Um, many of us think of trigger as a negative, but also trigger could be positive. If I call to you and I say, I know I have plans for you that are to prosper you and not to harm you, hopefully that gives you an action of, I'm kind of the shit. I have some self-love going on. This other person that speaks that to me loves me, respects me. Therefore, I must be worthy of that, right? So you're sharing so much, so much. Yes, let's have it. Yes. What uh, what are you doing for Juneteenth? How are you celebrating? What are your plans? So for Juneteenth, so um, what I'm doing to celebrate is um, there's a few things that I like to do and I try to kind of mess it up a little bit, switch it around a little bit. But usually I will bring in some kind of ground nut into my celebration. So that means that I will um, celebrate with a peanut soup. I'll celebrate with a ground nut soup. I'll celebrate with sweet potato. Um, I'll celebrate with gender and horseradish and I'll make a meal out of it. I'll separate a little side of that meal for my enslaved ancestors that helped create the path for me to be free. And when we're setting the side and someone says, Sherry, I don't have a ground nut. I don't even know what a ground nut is. <laughs> Can I still celebrate you? <laughs> well, hopefully. <laughs> From listening to everything we have. Do you have a nut? Do you have anything that came from the ground that you want to use to give to your ancestors to help express freedom? Then please use that. Please, please. If you have um, herbs, you can use collards, mustard, kale. Um, if you want to use any kind of herbs, you can use holy basil, you can use thyme, sage, oregano rosemary chives, all of these things were herbs that were accessible and available in Africa when they were brought over. If there's a um, myth that I like to associate more with folklore, that the reason that there's black seed and um, black seed rice in certain parts of Southern California, I'm sorry, uh, certain parts of South Carolina, there's black seed and then there's also the golden rice seed. Um, the black seed rice and the golden seed rice were all brought over in folklore in the indigenous women's hair as braids. So that they always had something that reminded them of home to prosper with. So they would take the seeds out and they would plant into the crops. And that's how we have the um, southern rice that everyone knows about, that I believe, I'm trying to remember the name, it's escaping me, I'm looking it up right now. Um, there's a certain kind of gold rice that everyone uses and now it's escaping me. So if anyone that's listening remembers the exact rice name, let me know. Um, but that is one folklore around rice. So even if you have rice, um, you can use that. If you have something that is more traditional in your own system that you want to use and celebrate liberation, then feel free to do that. Um, there's a Black food historian named Chef Michael Twitty, and he is on afroculinaria.com, and he teaches people how to use food cultivation from the perspective of ancestor. So he'll teach you how to make a yummy pot of greens, but he will help you understand why that yummy part, pot of greens means so much to ancestor. Did, did you by chance see the Netflix uh, docu-series High on the Hog? Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that would be a great way to celebrate Juneteenth, people out there, if you don't have any plans. High on the Hog is a fascinating examination of food and African-American and African history. It was, I love that series so much. The, the one um, 
part of the episode, because there were so many episodes in that anthology, but there was one that focused on the yam and the sweet potato and how they're not the same thing. <laughs> um, and I think that speaks to us on substitution, especially as those of us that consider ourselves witches or healers or practitioners. There are many times that we go into our pantry to do a certain body of work and we don't have that body. We don't have that ingredient, that one thing. Um, and then we get caught up in it and we go, oh, well, then the spell's not going to work. Um, I think that that comes from a place of fear, false evidence that appears real. It's not real. It's not real. If I have nothing, one of the things that I talk about in the first chapter of the book is if you have nothing else other than intention, faith, and direction, then you're good. If you have nothing else other than intention, faith, and direction, it has been guiding all of us as spiritual healers since the beginning of time. When I breathe life into something, I truly breathe life. I didn't have to go to a store for that breath. I didn't. You didn't have to go to the store for that breath. <laughs> oh, Sherry, I just love you so much. I hate to have to start wrapping this up. <laughs> but I do want to give our coven mates who are here an opportunity to ask you a question or give you a compliment. Cass says no questions for me, but she's so excited to be here. Thank you, Sherry Schoen. And oh, I see Julia. <laughs> That's good. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Julie. Um, thank you so much for this really rich conversation. Um, my question is about when liberation movements are co-opted. And I'm wondering, how do we fight this? Um, I'm kind of at a point where I don't think it's possible to prevent it under capitalism. But I think it is possible to fight it. I've seen different strategies, you know, the body positivity movement became co-opted. So people are now using a different term, body liberation, although I'm seeing that co-opted too. So I don't know if it's just going to be like name replacement after name replacement, or I see some people talking about feminism being co-opted and they'll point that out. That's capitalistic feminism. Um, and I'm just wondering if you have other ideas or thoughts about the fact that probably most social justice movements will be co-opted at some point in some way. And I, I think they will. Thank you for bringing that up. I, I kind of have to go back to my root system and my belief system. And I truly feel that when something comes in to try to divide and destroy, right? We as hoodoo practitioners, we as social workers, we are as healers, our job is to continue to work our way through that, regardless of the distraction. We get distracted. And that is what the antithesis of love is about. Is it's about worry about this so that you don't focus on the deliverance. So if you're coming from a place of your focus on the deliverance and someone wants to brand it some way differently or talk about it differently or try to join on, it won't to me matter because you're staying on your path. And if that other group entity wants to, you know what, have at it with them, but you know where you're going as Julie. And you're going to stand your standard up here. And therefore, if they want to use a different standard, that's up to them. But that's not where you're at. I love that. Risa and I always say, like, we, we get down by exactly, Julie, what you're talking about. Like, everything that we want to be, like, beautiful and spacious and healing has a price tag attached to it or some bullshit. And so we just remind each other, like, there's so much bullshit. There's so much baloney. There's so much bullshit. All we can do is try not to be bullshit. Mm -hmm. to try to be a voice in the crowd that's not bullshit and even that feels hard you know we're always checking ourselves we're always checking and by we I don't mean me and me Risa I mean everyone in our coven you know we're always checking ourselves um but yeah just I, I mean you didn't ask me this question but my answer is just like try not to be bullshit when everyone around you is bullshit just try not to be bullshit I really like that. I really like that. 
Um, and a final way to celebrate Juneteenth is to use your money because that's where we are. Use your money that you donate, that you buy, that you visit to help in liberation causes. So that means that if you're getting ready to buy something from a local bakery and you have an option to buy it from a black owner, can you try to seek that out for Juneteenth? Before you buy something that's a new dress or earrings or maybe you're shopping at a local farmer's market and you see that there's a black vendor could you try to go at least check them out? I'm not saying buy anything, but just check them out. Because many times it's about that awareness and making yourself cross the street. Because when you're used to using the same things and we're, we get ritual in our, even our shopping, at least I do, where I go to the same store and I buy the same things because it's comfortable for me and that's what I know. But to seek out and to look up online, it's amazing that if you look up online and you try to find black owned restaurants, black owned hair stores, black owned spiritual shops, how many opportunities and options for your dollar out there than you maybe never knew of. And the, the option being like going on Amazon and buying like Lakeisha said, you know, <laughs> Juneteenth themed <laughs> serviettes and, and cups. And, and if you must buy a Juneteenth t-shirt, could you find it from a black vendor? Please, please find it from a black vendor. And if you're going to wear it from a black vendor local, it, that'd be great. And if you're going to wear a pride t-shirt like Lakeisha is wearing today, that's got these beautiful, luscious rainbow lips on it. Like, again, yeah. you know, try to get it from someone who is actually going to benefit right. from the cause and not just, you know, line their pockets. Yeah. yeah. Did that help answer your question at all, Julie? <laughs> yes, thank you so much. It, it did. I think it also helps my existential angst in terms of where to be putting my efforts. And maybe it's not actually productive to be putting my effort on how people are messing up the movement, but to focus on my corner of the movement that's doing amazing stuff. So thank you. <laughs> You're giving yourself the permission to go, look at all the shit I'm doing. That's amazing. Because I mean, how many of us in our own walks with ancestor, many times our ancestors just want to lift us up. I have plans for you. <laughs> They're plans for you. They're not something that is to put you in a corner and say, oh, you should have done better. No, it's look at all you've done. You know, my, um, my ancestor walk with my dad one of the things that I want people to do as they work with my dad is to learn how to open your arms and embrace the beauty of me, embrace the beauty of you in your walk. Self-love is huge. It is huge. I have a whole self-love ritual that I share. And, and so it's just, it's just so good. There's just so many good things about us that are worth celebrating and worth being happy and worth being liberated on, that it's a good time to enjoy all of that during this month. And you've given us such, such a good thing to focus on, Sherry, intention, faith, and direction. And yes. what other people are doing, we can't allow it to affect mm -hmm. our direction. We might have to let it affect our, our path because our path is to study to keep our minds focused on the deliverance that we're here to do. If that means social justice, if that means whatever your cause is, even if your cause is no cause, that's mm. still a deliverance request. Yeah. I don't want to be muddled down with the bullshit. Okay, then that's what your deliverance request is. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to be muddled down with bullshit. I really don't, but I do. <laughs> I, I do want everyone to um, just e examine this notion of emancipation in your life, yeah. in the lives of the people that you love, in the lives of the people you hate. <laughs> Why not yeah. <laughs> examine this notion of, an, of emancipation? And maybe we can even emancipate ourselves from that hatred 
if we think about the emancipation of the people we hate. Mm-hmm. There's so many, like you say, you know, self-love is a version of emancipation. Obviously, we are here to talk about um, Black civil rights because it's Juneteenth and we have to keep our focus on that. But we can take these notions of emancipation and we can carry them with us, whatever our, our personal or ancestral history is. Absolutely. And I wanted to circle back on something. Once I moved my house, because my, my dad told me to move by April 1st, 2020. He said, you will be in your new house by April 2020. And so we packed up everything in my old house in Colorado, brought it over to there. And once we got everything unpacked, Oh my goodness, listeners. I wish you were here with us right now. Sherry is showing us the pink lady quilt and it's more beautiful and pink than I ever could possibly have imagined in my wildest dreams. Uh, I can't believe what great shape it's in. It's like shaped like nothing I've ever seen. This, this quilt is probably 75, 80 years old. And it's like, it's the white is like Javex. Like, I don't know how a child could have ever touched this. <laughs> Parts of it where, you know, in the thread, she re some stuff and patched up stuff. But, and I can see thread that's gone because I remember I used to put my fingers through some of the little holes of the patch where the patchwork is out. And she would be like, stop. Sherry, as a Juneteenth gift to us all, can can we have your grandma? Yeah. Thank you so grandma, much. Please, if you do anything, she loves to be um, sung to. She would. She had beautiful white hair that was down to her shoulders. She was first native and also black, and so she had long braids in her hair, um, but every wrinkle of her in her 90 something years meant something everyone and um for gran i just i just i had someone do some ritual work with her and they said that she she would lead them to a river and she would dunk their head in whenever they tried to say something belittling to themselves good and that's my grand <laughs> that's grand so we can evoke you we can evoke Sherry's grand when we are tempted to talk badly to ourselves and give ourselves a little Absolutely. metaphorical yeah. head dunking yeah. water. No, don't, don't, please don't dunk me in the water. Yes, because she just, she really was about, you know, in an area where she was born in 1899 and to be told that she could be a single mother of two children and be successful washing clothes taking care of other people's children and homes. And she was still free. And her body, she was just as free as a CEO somewhere else. You said she liked to be sung to. So can you sing us out for Juneteenth, for your grandma, for all grandmas, for all pink quilts everywhere, and for our emancipation? Absolutely. So I'm singing on the Lift Every Voice and Sing, which is the national... Um, the Black National Anthem. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmony of liberty. Let our rejoice Sing rise high as the sea skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sherry, thank you so much for sharing your liberation with us and helping us with our own liberation. I want to wish you and all of our listeners a very, very happy Juneteenth, not because of the napkins, but because of the idea of liberation, about passing the message of you are 
free. And it might take two years to get from the president's mouth to your to your ear. But uh, <laughs> as Caress Scarborough said to me, the point is that we heard. Let's keep our voices open. Let's keep our voices. Lift every voice. Thank you so much. Happy Juneteenth, everybody. And thank you. So, oh, 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 my goodness. Yes. And buy the book. When is the, I know it's available for pre-order right now, um, but I believe it, it, you'll, it officially comes out in August. August 23rd. I will be in Denver, Colorado at Goddess Isis Books for the book signing. Oh yay! Okay, well we'll we'll come back around to that in August. But in the meantime, you can celebrate your Juneteenth by putting a few of your dollars into Sherry's royalty fund and yay. purchasing Hoodoo for Everyone: Modern Approaches to Magic, Conjure, Root Work, and Liberation by Sherry Schoen. Also, while you're at it, please check out uh, the Hoodoo Guide to the Bible. Uh, Sherry's first book, which again has been foundational for me, and uh, on Instagram at Instagram at that Hoodoo Lady. Go follow and I keep it easy. Yeah, and once again, let's let's all leave by asking ourselves, what makes you free? What makes you free? What makes you free? And with that, bless the fucking be. Bless the fucking be. You must be a witch. Just a reminder that the Missing Witches podcast is entirely listener funded. If you love the project and want to support us and join in on conversations like this one live, find us on Patreon at patreon.com slash missing witches.